This is Jonas from Catatonia. You're watching Metal Blast. <laughs> Hi everyone, we're here today with Jonas from Catatonia at in uh, Utrecht for the concert today with Catat uh, with Lacuna like Coal and Paradise Lost. Jonas, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. You just released the album Dethrone and Uncrown, which is this reimagining of uh, Dead End Kings. Uh, the, the, the obvious question about that is, why did you decide to do it? And at the same time, do you often encounter that some of your music could have been presented in a different fashion? Um, I think especially on Dead and Kings, and that's why we actually did it this time. It's like we were listening to uh, what was underneath all of the m metal music, and we realized there is a lot of really nice, good music happening there. Uh, so it was just an um, experiment, really, uh, uh, like an idea that turned into something bigger. And uh, the final result, I think it's really it's nice it's pretty much what we were expecting from it when we just first had this vision of what we could do if we stripped all the metal stuff i was talking with nick holmes of well of paradise loss of course and and we discussed because he they released this tragic illusion 25 this recopilation of yeah. rarities and they did a couple <coughs> sorry a couple of re-recordings for instance of the song uh, gothic from the early 90s and he did mention that you often look back uh, not you, but you know, in general, as an yeah. artist, you look back on your discography and think that something could have been presented differently, or the track list could have been different. Although you, although he sometimes thinks, well, you know, we did the best we could with the I equipment we had back then and our abilities back then. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that, or do you think that there are things in your career, in terms of the music you put out, that you regret, or or the way, or that they should have been different? Uh, well, I think. Uh of course, if we did uh, some of the stuff that we have done in the past, if we did it now, it would be different. But I don't see a reason to feel uh, not satisfied with it. Because as as you said, as Nick said, we did the best we could as well, you know. And that's the presentation we wanted back then. And that's the one that counts. So if you go up and mess around with things... Uh, a long time later, I think it will just be a parody, really. As a very prolific artist, you have a, a lot of, you know, it's not just Catatonia, you have a bunch of projects uh, under your belt. In, in the case of uh, Dethrone and Crown, the reason why you needed to do uh, fan funding was because you didn't get support from the label. So as I said, as, as a very prolific artist, have you encountered a lot of times that business considerations or labels decisions do stonewall your artistic uh, endeavors? Uh, not really. I, I think our label is kind of open-minded actually uh, and they were very much into this idea it's just that we, we didn't have a, like, a budget for it so uh, uh, that's why we did a pledge campaign to actually realize the whole thing so um, I don't think that we have compromised very much throughout our career uh, we wouldn't do it, you, you know, it's, um, we're not here to compromise our art, really, so uh, if, like, a record label or, or management should start s telling us what to do just because of a business reason, I don't think we would do it if we weren't happy with it, so. You talk about not compromising your music. Uh, you have said that as a band, Catatonia, you know, they write the music for themselves. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, you want to see your fans, of course, happy. So how do you strike this balance of not compromising your music, but at the same time trying to make the fans happy? Well, it's, uh, as you say, it's a balance, you know. Um, you have to uh, to think a little bit. I don't think it's compromising if you, uh, if you decide not to do like a seven-minute song full of just noise, just because you would like it at the time. But... Of course, you have to consider what would work in a like a live environment, or what 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 would suit the album that we're doing right now. You know, you can't just maybe experiment too much. But uh, I think we're lucky enough to have fans that you know they sort of mature in the same pace as we do. So 
because our music has changed through the years naturally and I think people have changed with it as well so it's um it's a bit of a of, of a balance but at the same time I think uh, we have fans with great taste you know you, you mentioned that uh, your music has changed over time of course and and, and, and I agree you're credited as one of the founders of the doom death metal this yeah. mixing of the depressing and slow tempo of doom and the growling and violent vocals of uh, death metal uh, just like paradise lost with whom you're sharing stage today at the same time you have been uh, labeled as gothic metal uh, alternative metal etc do you think that is there a category in which you can set catatonia and what category do you feel is closer to to what you want to do as an artist uh it's difficult to say i mean when we started out we were basically just a death metal band and then when we started uh, playing a little bit slower and adding these more um as we would say sorrowful melodies uh it turned into some kind of doom death but i guess gothic metal would probably be the appropriate uh if that's what we're doing you know i i, I don't really care about the the tagging uh, of music but I mean I, I still consider us a metal band we're not death metal anymore but we have this um, dark thing going which is probably coming from the gothic genre regarding the the gothic metal uh, well I was talking with Nick in this interview that we did and like he said w we talked about the definition of gothic because it's considered that with their album uh, gothic gothic yeah. uh, it sort of started the genre but that over the years it just changed completely now gothic is seen as this hot topic uh, corset yeah. thing so he said that you know how I told him like how would you define gothic metal he said paradise loss slash evanescence so <laughs> yeah. how would you define uh, gothic metal in what you understand you are putting out there well f to me and and I guess Anders when we started the band we listened to what we would say was gothic music and to us it was uh, probably the the Paradise Lost album that we just talked about and also uh, 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 Fields of Nephilim you know uh, UK uh, UK bands that were into the dark side of things like Sisters of Mercy maybe so um for me that the whole evanescence thing has nothing to do with gothic or even a lot of other bands you know that are very popular today just because you have like a uh, melodic approach maybe a female vocalist or melodic male vocals it doesn't make it gothic you know to me gothic is dark stuff basically so it has to do not just with the sound of course but also with the content uh, yeah. of the music yeah uh, because i think you know Gothic itself comes from a what is it like architecture or or a style of uh, you know the cathedrals and stuff like that. So uh, it has nothing to do with hot topic. I think I, I agree, but yeah. but it, it's it's one of the sad things that you see that once you realize that that a certain genre or a certain style becomes profitable, they will just try to milk it as uh, as yeah, far yeah, as yeah, possible. Of course, of course. Uh, uh, since since you mentioned this dark content, catatonia. Uh, Stephen Wilson, which you, you work Opeth, and uh, of course Paradise Lost are known for these very dark and uh, occasionally depressing uh, yeah. lyrics. Uh, w when I and I'm sorry that I keep repeating it. When, when I talk with Nick Holmes, I asked him about the same thing because now he has this career, he has a nice family, etc. So I said, "Well, do you look at your lyrics and think, well, this is something that I'm putting out because I'm a character out there in the stage, which is completely acceptable?" Yeah. Or do they still represent you? He said they still represent a very dark side of me. Yeah. Uh, in your case, what is the relation that you have with the content, uh, the, the the lyrical content of your music? Um, to me, lyrics are very important. But, um, they make up half of the impact of the album, I think. Um, uh, so of course, I want them to be as good as possible. I like writing them, uh, and as the case with Nick here, it's uh, pretty much the same with me. They represent me still very much it's personal um, it's like yeah the dark side of me probably um, at the same time of course I'm not like that all you know 24 7 but still when it comes to the music we we try to, to create something dark and atmospheric with the music and the lyrics have to go hand in hand with that and just make the whole experience of the album as 
good as possible in terms of what people expect or what we expect from it. So it it's always got to be dark. In topic of dark lyrics, uh, I was very interested. I was reading some uh, academic papers on the topic of the relation between this dark music, dark lyrics, and uh, the moods and the mental uh, disorder sometimes yeah, of yeah. some of the fans and. Th there, there is a relation between the kind of people that listen to Catatonia or Fade to Black by Metallica yeah, or yeah. Stephen Wilson and Opeth and Depressive uh, or Suicidal Ideation. The question was whether this type of music actually represents the cause or, or something that people are attracted to. So do you, do you think that w in your case, when you encounter this type of music, is it something that you listen to depressive lyrics? It, it's depressing or is it more cathartic to encounter it? Yeah, I would say the it's um, it's relieving to see that someone else is experiencing the same thing. It's not depressive for me to read depressive lyrics. It's more like a familiar feeling. And I don't think uh, listening to this kind of music is harmful in any way. If you are a person that sort of knows your inner state it's more cathartic maybe or relieving yeah i agree we we talked with, with steven wilson about the same topic and we we agree on the fact that it is just nice to see i'm not alone on this yeah. uh, someone else is feeling it and in, in my personal experience throughout my life it has always been nice to say to a, to an extent you know they get it yeah. it is nice to encounter that someone else has gone thing. through it yeah uh now recently you toured the United States with Alpeth and one time you shared a stage with Stephen Wilson. So the question that popped up in ma many fans' minds is, have you considered working with him as the producer of a Catatonia album? Uh, we have actually been talking to Stephen uh, over the years to to uh, have him as a producer or maybe a mixer. Uh, it, it never happened yet because he's a very busy man. Uh, it's kind of expensive too, I believe. <laughs> but um, yeah, he mentioned I think that he has a lot of requests yeah, 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 all yeah, the time. Yeah, super many. Uh, he's so, so talented. I mean, uh, uh, probably a lot of people queuing up to to get a part of his knowledge in, in music and, and production. So um, I'm not saying it's never going to happen. I mean, if there would be a good space and time for it, I would be up for it. And and Stephen is. Um, very friendly uh, man, um, so I guess he wouldn't say no if he had the time. And but it's it's all in the future probably. Yeah, but I mean, you all know each other. You yeah, play yeah. together. There is a chance that maybe you can get a discount at least. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> uh, in the Stephen Wilson movie in Insurgentes, in Insurgents, uh, you, Michael from from Opeth and and Stephen are talking a little bit about the cliches in mm -hmm. metal. Yeah. How you know the covers? They you know, if you look at the Cannibal Corpse covers, they tend to be these disgusting things, yeah. and all of them try to share the dark. And you mentioned that it is what the fans expect. This is what they want. Yeah. So, so you, do you think that this cliches in metal, this thing about just uh, preaching to the crowd, uh, preaching to the choir, uh, just doing the same thing over and over and over, it is something that has increased over time? Do you see that metal perhaps has become? cheaper since you started uh, being in metal that it's more commercial nowadays mm. absolutely um, uh, I think it's because it's trying always to reach out to I mean the commercial aspect of metal it's trying to reach out to younger audiences all the time and then you have to adapt your image or style of music or record covers whatever to um, and uh, I don't know. I I take it very seriously, so I wouldn't. Um, I don't like to see that sort of childification going on just to make kids love it and uh, just to make money. You know, it's, for me, it's uh, it's not about that. So, um, but still, I think it's uh, valuable to k keep some of the cliches. I mean, death metal, for example. I wouldn't want to buy a death metal album with a flower on the cover like Opeth once released you know it should be corpses 
<laughs> what, what did you think about the last Opus cover, the the tree with all the faces? That it did shock a lot of people yeah, when it came yeah. out. No, I think that's a great cover, uh, actually, um, because it sort of represents the band in a in a way with the tree, uh, but the roots are like this leading down to hell and to the devil because that's where they came from, you know. And the fruits on the trees are the band members. It's genius in a kind of simple way, I think. One of the things that uh, I believe, well, Stephen mentioned how a lot of people uh, hate him because uh, they see him as the guy who softened up yeah. Opus, even though it was Michael's idea. He wanted to go in the di direction. Yeah. Uh, do you think, as a, as a musician that has had a style that has changed over time, that at some point fans just well, metal fans are pretty problematic anyway. They ca they ca we, we can be quite annoying. So yeah. uh, do, do you think that there is this problem that they, they feel quite possessive about the artists? So they want the band that they met, they never want them to change. Have you encountered that problem? Um, not too much, I think. I think some artists have had it worse in that kind of scenarios. But um, of course, uh, people sometimes seem to get a bit disappointed if I'm smiling or something they're like what why <laughs> well in the case of Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails uh, I remember that he used to have a Twitter account or something and many and years ago he deleted it because people were starting to complain that he was married and he had yeah. a nice life because he has his his sons and, and yeah, his yeah. wife and they don't want him to be happy I mean no. you, you you wrote hurt you, yeah, you exactly. cannot change yeah. that yeah yeah of course people have like a um, a picture in their minds that they don't want to be destroyed by seeing like that the artists uh, probably are just normal people behind the all of the uh, musical lyrical image whatever so uh, but I think uh, that uh, that's a just a, that kind of person has a problem if they can't face it like it's take Nick Holmes for example. He's he's probably the funniest guy I've, I've ever met in my life. But still, he's you know I can see that he's still a pessimistic, grumpy, PL guy. So uh, we all have different sides, probably. Well, even on stage, he's known as, as a bit of a joker, and and yeah, some yeah. some people don't like that. They yeah, don't yeah. they don't they don't want him to laugh. No, and that's why he's cracking jokes probably because to make them more pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> do do you see? You know, since there is this difference between uh, Jonas the artist and Jonas the the the, the person, you know, yeah. the, you smile. Uh, yeah. So, so do you think that part of the of, of what you are on stage is a character that, although represents part of you, this darker side that we talked about, part of it is, you know, this is me in Catatonia. This is me as a person outside of of the stage. Um, I don't think the difference is that big actually because when I'm on stage I don't do much except for trying to sing and uh, uh, so I, I don't turn into this uh, clown or dark scarecrow or whatever you know it's just me standing there um, so the difference on stage isn't that big for me but I can see uh, you know other people uh, like Michael from uh, Opus for instance he's He's changing quite a bit when he's going on stage. Becomes this uh, funny character, just cracking jokes all the time, just uh, making fun of his bandmates, stuff like that. He's not like that behind the stage. He's very uh, uh, withdrawn and timid, you know. It's so the opposite of what you would expect from, uh, from yeah from his type of music. You would expect him to be very withdrawn, uh, a very dark on yeah, stage, yeah. and just the completely opposite when exactly, he's exactly no. He just swapped swapped it <laughs> you know, since we talk about this duplicity between artist and person which in your case you say that is not that big no. at the beginning when you started Catatonia you were not Jonas you were Lord Seth yeah. and I wanted to know why because I, I see something quite similar in the case of black metal bands yeah. uh, you don't have Christian you have uh, Gaal you don't have uh, Christian Vickerness, you have uh, what was the silly name? Count Grishnak yeah, yeah. so it was the same thing there in that back then was there a different person that you wanted to create as part of Catatonia? Yeah, totally. Back then it was much different. Um, first of all, we were uh, black metal fans at the time, you know. Um, so we wanted to uh, 
it was mainly because of the band Bathory, I think, because they had or he had a cool name, Quarthon, and we wanted something. And you know, the Dark Throne guys had nice names as well, so we just wanted to be part of that and create something that wasn't our Swedish names that would sound funny or <laughs> just uh, to us they just sounded like farmer names basically and so if you are trying to create a persona that it's it's gonna be a bit otherworldly that it was back then like some kind of ghoul or whatever of course you can't be named Jonas because <laughs> it just takes away all the magic so yeah uh, back then it was much more uh, trying to create something totally different from our normal persons uh, I know that it's completely different from what from the type of music that Katarzyna puts out now but when you were a fan of black metal and I, I have asked this to, to a bunch of black metal artists uh, Morgan from Marduk said that black metal will always be defined and a band can only consider themselves black metal when they deal with the occult, they deal with evil, they deal with the opposer, etc. Uh, while others are, of course, just it's just the sound. If it sounds like early immortal, like uh, Marduk or Burzum, etc., that is black metal. Yeah. Uh, as, a, as a big fan and a former black metal uh, musician to a point, yeah. uh, what do you understand black metal to be in that sense? Um, uh, well, I think black metal should have some kind of... Um, special uh, feeling that you don't get from maybe uh, your standard death metal bands it should be it should have one foot in the other world so the beyond and try to gain knowledge about that sort of you know just by writing music and lyrics that has a, a special spark to it I believe and it should be about you know as Morgan said there like it should be about the occult and the dark side otherwise it's just noise yeah well, well he did mention that immoral as important as they are the creation of the early Norwegian black metal yeah that now it's not black metal I mean when we're singing about mountains and dragons and how cold it is in the mountains when you encounter the dragons uh, it just doesn't it's not what should be black metal no exactly I mean if you have to judge it really like um, um, strictly yeah strictly then it it's probably not black metal no but it's still to uh, many people's ear I would say if someone just puts it on I would say oh this is black metal but if uh, if I would like to go deeper I would listen to something else probably it's uh, probably more a little bit more profound than that but th there is a certain importance in uh in having this connection with the with the occult, yeah, I think so. You, if you do black metal. Yeah, if you're into that, you should. If you want to create black metal, you should be interested in that and try to. To have something to do with it, basically. When. Um, do you, do you think that w in your writing process of music, uh, is it important for you to 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 be in a very dark place uh, when you do it? Uh, do you have a very strict method to write the type of lyrics that you write? Um, not really. Um, I think it used to be more like that actually when uh, back in the day. Nowadays it's um, I can easily easily portray myself in whatever kind of situation I want to be if I'm in a creative mood so I don't have to be all depressed just to try to make music and lyrics. It's just it's a matter of understanding my own personality and just go into it instead of waiting for the right time. When we speak about the creativity, I heard that you you also write short stories and things like that that you send to friends and etc. Yeah. Do, do, do you think that there's ever going to be a chance that you might publish any of them? No, they're no, they're not good enough. I don't think. I mean, uh, no, but I, I would love to write something more seriously uh, uh, in in due time. You know, uh, right now it's just uh, a matter of writing weird poetry and just sending it out to to annoy people, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look at what I wrote. I'm going to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
so so that we can leave you alone. Uh, Bloodbath. Yeah. Uh, there was supposed to be an album, uh, 2013, and didn't yeah. appear. So are we going to wait for it, 2014? Yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, yes. But you know, the last couple of years has been so busy for Catatonia. We've been doing more touring than we would ever bargain for, really. You know. Um, so and we did this uh, uncrowned thing. We did a V Emptiness re mix thing and uh, it's just taken a lot of time so bloodbath had to be pushed aside for a while but now we're on it you know as soon as we get back home from this tour we will continue the writing that we already started so we're looking at record start the recording in january actually so anders mentioned that because the contract was not signed they couldn't say who this legendary singer yeah. was can you say who the legendary singer is? No. God damn it. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, well, Jonas, thank you so much. I, I, I took a lot of your time, so I really appreciate it. I don't care. I have nothing else to do anyway, and it was really fun. Thank okay, you. that's great. Uh, any final words for your fans? Uh, thank you for the support. As always, that's all I ever say.